Well, here we are with Cassidy Pope. Welcome. Thank you. We're so happy to have you. Happy to be here. This is kind of like we could be doing this with wine or coffee because we've known each other forever. That's true. That maybe we should do the wine thing next time. I like it. And just have wine during the the next taping. I, I'm all for it. <laughs> okay, good. Pick your poison and I'll yeah. have it and we'll do this thing all over again. Yay. So we go way back. It's crazy how small the world is and little did we know. We met each other back in 2012 in Los Angeles. Both of us, I think, at a crossroads in what we were doing in our career. Yes. And we, we met on the set of The Voice. I was working with talent and I met Cassidy and instant love. Oh, right back at you. I wasn't supposed to play favorites, but whoops. I mean, honestly, I think all of us were just so nervous and so excited to meet people such as yourself who were like comforting and nurturing. You were so good at talking me off a ledge, you know, oh. all of us were so, so nervous that it just was nice to be able to confide in, in you. So yeah. thanks for that. It was one of my favorite things that I've gotten to do professionally because that's exactly what it was, was being able to sort of be a protector. Yeah. You know, and the crazy part about my job at ASCAP is that it's a melting pot of everything I've ever done. Right. And that was such a big part of it. And that's what I do now too, is, is nurture and protect and, and talk people off ledges, you know, yeah. because this is a crazy industry and it's, and it helps me get through life and creative mm -hmm. stuff. Right. Yeah. Even talking with you. So Aww. yeah, here we are. I know All these years crazy. later, I think we're, we're doing, doing okay. It. We are doing it. I think we are happy gals. Yes, we are. I know. Especially the conversation before we started recording about where we are in our lives and yeah. living situations and how fun it is to be with your your significant other. That's right. So and it's all make good. big steps together and, and kind of walk through this weird journey yeah. that is the music industry together and yeah. have a creative partner that wants to do that with you. So it's pretty special. It is. I agree. So girl, let's jump right into it. It's been a year since Stages came out. I know. What? It's crazy. Are you letting it breathe or are you already digging into new stuff? I mean, I started writing, I would say like six months after the album came out. So it, it was um, not that I don't love stages and I will continue to promote it and continue to hopefully see it grow. Um, I just, there's just so much life that keeps happening that I felt like, I needed to document and stay creative. I, I had signed with BMG Publishing um, now, I guess, like seven months ago or something like that. So that was another big boost in my right. calendar of like, OK, now they're starting to fill up my dates with writing sessions, which was cool. But yeah, Stages is still a really special project to me. There was a song on stages called How I Feel Right Now that you wrote with Sarah Buxton and Corey Crowder, two of yes. my favorites. Yes. And um, it was kind of about embracing where you're at, even though you know it's going to change. So as a songwriter, do you think it's important to write about things you're going through in the moment? Or do you mm -hmm. like a little bit of distance when you're writing? I find it to be a lot easier for me to write when it's in the moment. I mean, I sometimes I'll pull from past experiences. And for some reason, when it's in hindsight and when you're you've had time to like, I don't know, sit with the feelings. For some reason, it's harder for me to go back. But um, yeah, how I feel right now was, I mean, it fell out. Like it was yeah. so easy. I mean, I sat there and just explained where I was in this new relationship at the time. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been in a long-term relationship. I know this like butterflies, exciting feelings right. subsides at some point, but I'm just excited and that's how I feel right now. Um, so I love when songs are, are easy to write like that because it, it really, when I play it live and I listen back to it, I think, man, that's such a perfectly laid out thought and feeling. I, I remember it so easily. I mean, I still have it, thankfully, right. <laughs> but, um, you know, I remember writing it and feeling that exact feeling because the song is so like plain as day, right? lyrically. So that, that was a cool moment. Do you use your songwriting sessions to sort of work through anything that you're going through at the time? A little therapy uh, session? Kind of. I think more than like working through it and fa and like harnessing my feeling, it's really getting it out of my mouth. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, I, I do a great deal of um, therapy, like talk therapy. Mm -hmm. So I I get to talk through my feelings all the time, which is awesome so by the time I go into a session it's more of like okay now I'm ready to 
turn it into an art form and share right. it with people sometimes people I've never met which is really weird <laughs> but um yeah it's it's therapeutic in a way of like okay these are weird feelings I might feel alone and feeling and then um eventually they'll come out and eventually I'll realize I'll realize oh my god I'm not alone which is like a really right. awesome feeling too have you collected a pretty solid group of co-writers that you find yourself always going back to to write with I yeah I have um I love working with Corey Crowder, my who's my producer as well. Um, Shout out to Corey Crowder, we love, love you. Corey, he's the best. Um, I love writing with Sarah Buxton. She just brings such a amazing energy to the session, and she's she's just so good with melodies. Oh my and goodness. she's one of my all time favorite songwriters. Yeah, period, yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, I I remember c- first coming to town and and not really understanding how the um, getting pitched a song process went and I remember getting pitched a lot of Sarah Buxton songs and being like yes 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 <laughs> and then I would go and like s- try to sing it myself and I'd realize I think I'm picking these songs mainly because I love her voice oh, I know. and maybe they're not the best song for me because when I sing it it doesn't sound the same um so yeah I'm a big fan of Sarah Buxton um I do a lot of writing with Emily Shackleton. Love her. Love her. I've had a lot of really good writing sessions with Mark Holman, mm-hmm. um, sort of a newer uh, person I've been writing with. Um, gosh, there's there's a bunch. Ben West. I love Ben West. And Kelly Archer. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I've been writing with a lot of, not new songwriters, but new to me yeah. um, because of the BMG partnership, but... You know, um, those are the ones that I've been writing with for a long time. It's so cool because you sang a Sarah Buxton song on The Voice. And I remember when that yeah. was happening because I have loved Sarah and known Sarah for such a long time. I think I even texted her. I was like, this is happening. And this girl, you're going to like, Aww. she's going to be in your world, you know, because it was this perfect match of your voice with a special song. Aww. And she's just a well of them. And then also such a a big champion for other women and just yeah. other creative people and and so to, to see that you guys have continued to write and she's been a part of your journey is really cool because it was almost like foreshadowed with you know that's you true seeing such a special song of hers yeah that some man recorded right like I know crazy. and I had heard I mean I didn't know that she had recorded it as well or at least that put out a version of her own um and so before I went into rehearse with the band on the voice I looked at her version and I was like okay now I'm wrapping my head around it a little bit easier totally. now that I'm hearing it from a female's perspective. Cause it was a song I wanted to sing. I, I had chosen it. Um, cause I love that song, but I was like, okay, I've just chosen the song. That's not particularly voicey. Right. How am I going to make it that? And so she helped me with her video and just reworking it in general was really fun. But, um, I just texted her the other day cause I, um, my manager and I were talking about how like it's sort of, a lost art for artists to just text writers and be like, Hey, if you have songs you've written that you love, um, that you think would be a good, uh, fit for me, feel free to send them. And I texted her that and she was super like really receptive and like, yes, I'd love to send you stuff. So I kind of think, and that's kind of the way that A&R is going these days. Yeah. Would you agree that it sort of so much of song placement is sometimes based on the relationship with you have with the writer or certainly in Nashville? Yeah, I think that that's what makes it special. I mean, obviously, if you're on the outside and you're just, you're new and you're like trying to infiltrate and be like, hey, it's, I'm so-and-so, can I have some songs? Mm. Then it's <laughs> like not the best scenario sure. that it's like so personal. But once you get in there and once you put in the work and the time um, and the effort, it really is, it's just a lot more fulfilling when you find a song um, that you really connect to, but you found it by just hitting up a, a songwriter that you're friends with or that you're a fan of. And, um, you know, that's to me, like when I was a little girl wanting to be a singer someday, those are the stories that made me really excited to be in the music industry right. someday. So it's cool to be able to, you know, keep doing stuff like that, keep that alive. Absolutely. Well, you've always been a a writer on on so much of the material since the very early days um and I've always admired your taste in songs that you didn't write so when you're listening to songs that are outside what do you listen for I mean I listen for I am a sucker for a good melody I love 
melodies. I think, you know, growing up and being obsessed with Avril Lavigne and Michelle mm-hmm. Branch and Shania Twain and the Backstreet Boys. I mean, those are that's just like melody heaven. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. I, of course, have to to be drawn to the lyric. I, I'm trying to be a little bit more open minded right now in the process of like, OK, if this feels like a hit and I love it, but I didn't go through this particular thing. Maybe I should just go at it at a different angle and be like, well, have I gone through something similar or right. has somebody I love gone through something like this? Cause like I have definitely, I, I know that I have said no to songs that are for sure hits, but because right. I was like, this isn't exactly what I've been through. This isn't perfectly <laughs> my life. Uh, moving on. So I listen for, I do listen for lyrics, um, for you know feeling connected to them yeah and Um, I think you passing on those songs that's part of your journey as well because yeah in that part of your career you really just wanted to sing something that felt so natural as if you could have written it yeah I think that's what stages was for me because it was like I have this opportunity I'm doing this independently um I have the opportunity to make a record that is so like exactly to a T what I've been through through and through Mm and I don't know if I'm, I want to hopefully have that opportunity down the road too, but maybe I will have to compromise a little bit given, you know, changes to my team or what have you. So like I just took advantage of that moment and was like really particular, but right now I'm being, I'm trying to be a little bit more open-minded with the subject matter, but I think those are the criteria um, mostly that I look for in a song that I haven't written. Yeah. I love that. I want to dig into your history a little bit. Oh boy. Because before you were a country star and on The Voice and all these things, you, there was your pop punk band, Hey Monday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Shout out. Can you talk about who you were as a music creator back then? I was reaching so hard to be super poetic and <laughs> uh, um, really trying to keep up with the bands with the crazy lyrics like Fall Out Boy and right. Panic at the Disco and... Uh, all so many bands that just I didn't know what they were talking about half the time you know and I just wanted to do that like I wanted to be that eloquent and um poetic cool. yeah Same cool time. I mean yeah <laughs> but um didn't quite get there <laughs> if you listen to our lyrics it's like oh man it's so angsty and just so not anything is nothing is to the imagination it's just really conversational and I kind of leaned into that and realized okay this is this is the kind of lyricist I am at least right now in my life um and I I mean I wrote everything um so that's why coming to Nashville and listening to outside songs was so foreign to me because I had been in this band and before I was in Hey Monday, I was in other bands growing up where right. I wrote everything. Um, so it was very, it felt very personal. Um, it felt new. I think, you know, the structure of the songs was new to me. I had already, already always written um, songs that were like really really discombobulated and there was no real structure and right. then once I was signed to Columbia Records with Hey Monday I started to work with bigger producers who sort of knew how to lay out a song and I felt like the songs took on more of like a structure right yeah is that something that you took with you when you started writing for your solo stuff definitely yeah I mean I I you know everybody has different lingos like I call, you know, the first thing in a song is the first verse and then you go into the pre-chorus and then the chorus and and everybody has different lingos. So there was a few times coming here to town where people had different words for different sections and I was really confused. But for the most part, I realized, oh, that they're just using different words. They they we're on the same page as far as the flow of the song. So that helped for sure, knowing that distinction. Always something that I've always loved about you is how you are. Obviously, there's probably a lot about your early career that you're like, man, I don't really identify with that a lot. No. Yeah. But you're <laughs> always very um, like gracious with yourself and like accepting that that was this major part of your journey and got you here. And I yeah. love that. I think that's important for people that are create just anyone who's a creator, whether you're writing a book or songs or whatever, to be forgiving of your early self as you're kind of transitioning and learning and you've always done a really good job of that thanks I mean I definitely it's a cool um it's a weird and awesome and 
interesting career trajectory I've had because I mean fans have known me since I was some of them since I was like 16 depending on you know if they're from West Palm Beach where I'm from um, and have seen me sing for a long time but I think it's awesome that we've grown together and I love hearing from fans that have been fans for a long time be like you have improved so much with your songwriting and I love being on this journey with you like that's the stuff that makes me feel like I will be able to do this forever because yeah. like, I have fans that have been there since the beginning so it's really validating to hear that kind of thing and that's also like a real life compliment thank you right yes. you're like oh man thanks I I, I feel that way I'm, I'm hope- glad that yeah you, know, you see that too it's not like I like your outfit girl it's like I know I you know. know it's really digging which is in awesome to hear as well I'm not gonna lie <laughs> but your hair looks so cute girl yeah and you've gotten a better at songwriting <laughs> and your lyrics I'll are great it. thank yes. you balance it's all about balance, <laughs> balance yeah <laughs> um so you guys hey Monday you just recently had a reunion show in November what was it like performing all those hey Monday songs with your bandmates after so long it was crazy. Um, so we, was it like a it trip? Was such a trip because I was like, you know, singing these old songs. I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll watch some videos of myself from back in the day. So like if there's like a little like arm movement that I forgot about, I could <laughs> throw it in there just so fans would know, you know, oh, she remembers. And I didn't I didn't do that. But then getting Did you up have a there, lot of hand I, movements. I get I realized when I was up there. I hadn't prepped at all. And I was like, I did stuff like very sassy, like, you know, angsty things that I was like, oh, my God, I did that back when I was on tour, you know, 11 years ago. So um, it was sort of a weird like muscle memory thing. But um, it was a trip because we had these fans. A lot of them I, you know, recognized um, and a lot of them I had never seen before that were singing every single word at the top of their lungs. We sold out Exit In here in town. and I'm looking at, you know, my left and right at the guys I played in that band with and toured the world with. And they don't look like they've even aged a day. So it's just it was like very trippy for me. Um, and it was really fun because we had a bunch of friends come in that night as well. A lot from out of town mm-hmm. came um, who were were or still are singers and bands that we have played with in the past. And they popped up to sing a song or two from their bands or old bands. So it was just a really like. I don't know, life giving night because yeah. it just it's so fun to be able to tip the hat to the past and to be Absolutely. proud of it and to see all these people in Nashville, Tennessee embracing it. It's just like I never thought I would move to Nashville and have a country career, but still be able to do some stuff with my old band like that. That never crossed my mind. So it's pretty fun. Yeah. When you were in that with the band how did you know when it was time to to do your own thing it was a hard decision because we had been signed to Columbia and we had also been signed as with a joint venture with Decadence Records which um is Pete Wentz's label from Fall Out Boy and we had gone on tour and we had always had a tour like a year out booked we were like busy and then when we started to not get tours and we started to the label started to ask me if I wanted to go solo, which is never a good sign. <laughs> um, and then our A and R left the label. We got a new label president. It just didn't feel right anymore. And um, you know, we were we were kids at that point. We right. had had a lot of ba- inner band turmoil. No, no more you know juicy than the normal like arguments and you know disagreements on creative direction and all that stuff. And so I just felt like you know what, I'm at that point, I was 20. I was like, or I was about to turn 21. And I was like, I'm 21. I need to see what else is out there. I think there's something more for me. Um, And it was a hard conversation to have. But um, thankfully, the guys understood. And I went off to LA, um, pursued a solo thing that was really confusing because it was sort of pop sort of country but sort of rock and it was not in a way where it's it was cool it was like the production was really (laughs) weird um and I tried to do a little solo acoustic tour where I remember the hardest show I think I've ever played was in Bakersfield and it was like five people came and it was just really um hard to go from being in a band where we were touring the world and had all these fans to now you know, I'm doing this. And I started to be like, why did I make this decision? Um, Fast forward probably 
six to seven months probably when the voice right. called and asked if I would audition. So it was it was a wild ride it leaving was. the band. I was like, whoops, did I make a mistake? Fortunately, I think it all kind of came together fairly quickly, certainly yes. by Los Angeles standards. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, I was being so... I was being really hard on myself by like, oh, this is taking so long because um, we reached a certain level. And when you sort of go back to square one, mm -hmm. it, it's it's sort of like confusing. It takes you a minute to be like, OK, this is just a temporary thing. But um, it was hard. I mean, people who really were the reason I moved to L.A. who promised me a lot of things didn't return my calls. And right. I got to L.A. with just nobody to help me other than my roommate who did help me a lot. But, um, you know, A&R wise, I had somebody who just totally ghosted me. So it was not a good uh, introduction to right. L.A. to the solo sure. career, you know. But no doubt that that time that you spent sort of figuring out on your own and those little shows that you'll never forget because they were such a little, like a monumental letdown, right? Oh, yeah. For, for someone to see five people when you're used to seeing thousands mm -hmm. to sort of mentally and creatively reset mm -hmm. before you went on to The Voice, that probably, it changed your perspective completely because you'd, you had done that work, you know? Yeah, yeah. It felt like... Um, if I had gone on The Voice, because they actually did ask me to come on the second season, but I was still in the band and I was I just wasn't ready. Um, I felt like, well, I never expected myself to do a show like The Voice because right. um, I was viewed it as eas the easy way out, which sure. it's not. <laughs> as we know, that is not the case. Yeah, shortly found out it was not. But yeah, I, um, I think if I had done it back in season two, I would have had a, like a mental breakdown. Like I just wasn't ready for something like that and then by the time it did come like you said I had time to put the work in and time to really um find my sound uh ish I think I found my voice more than my sound at right. that point but yeah it was a good it was good timing obviously you won and did I mean how much of a life changer was that or was the move to Nashville more of a life changer would um, you say I mean obviously they go hand in hand but yeah, I guess it all happened so fast together. Um, I, yeah, I guess when you're on that show, you're sequestered. So you don't realize how big it is until you yeah. get out and then everybody's recognizing you. So that was crazy. Um, that was a big life change. Um, and then, I mean, it was a culture shock for me to move here. More, less of like country music. It was more of like, I had been living in LA for a year at this point. Um, and before L.A., I, you know, I was living with my mom at home in West Palm Beach. When you were so, on the road, right? Which yeah, was, I was on the road a lot. So much. Mm -hmm. So it was just like I, I didn't really know what to do with myself. Um, I had a, a really scattered team. I had management in L.A. and then I had a bunch of team members here. But nobody, a lot of people hadn't worked together before. And it was just, it didn't feel, it just felt a little crazy um and then eventually I slowly started like being comfortable enough to talk to people about what I should do or where I should hang out or you know all that all that like uncomfortable growing pains like Absolutely. planting your roots stuff but yeah it was um it was it was a little bit of a scary move for me um so your d debut EP was straight up pop pop no the, the, the I'm going to start that over. <laughs> Your debut EP was a straight up pop rock record. Yeah. How did you figure out that you wanted to make a country record? When did that transition happen? Well, a lot of people don't know I sang country music as a kid. I, um, I, I learned to sing on people like Martina McBride and Trisha Yearwood and Faith Hill. So I grew up covering all those songs. And then... I did the pop punk thing when I was a teenager and I wanted to rebel and be in a band and I thought that was like cool and uh, that was a really fun journey. But then on The Voice was really like all the songs I did on The Voice I chose. So all those country songs were my choice, not Blake's, sure. which is a common misconception because he's a country artist and um, I totally see why people would think that he chose those songs for me. But um, I just knew like some of the, some of the best vocals come from country songs like 
I mean, as far uh, my finale song was Cry, and that's still one of like the hardest songs to sing for me. So um, I think on the show was when I started realizing I needed to go back to my country roots. I, th- I think the first song I sang, country song I sang was Over You, and that was a big moment for me on the show. I sort of felt like I blended in and I wasn't really making a splash. And then I sang that song and it was like, it all shifted for me. Um, the fans seemed to really enjoy it. It felt really good for me to do at that time. I felt like country music was like going more the pop rock route, which Mm -hmm. was perfect for me. Um, and so by the time the show was over, I had sang a bunch of pop songs, a bunch of rock songs, a bunch of country songs. And I was like, I mean, I feel like in my gut and my heart, the most, um, logical place for me to go is Nashville. I had been in LA, I'd done a lot of pop sessions and they were fun, but I didn't feel like I was getting my sound out of it. And, Mm -hmm. um, I had written here before, um, probably like when I was still in Hey Monday, actually, I came here to write with Emily Shackleton and, um, I was like, I know I love writing in Nashville, so I'm just going to do that. And I'm really glad I did. Right. Really glad. I love talking about your backstory because it's so interesting, and I'm sure a lot of people um, ha- were had the opportunity to get turned on to you because of it. But mm. the coolest part about your story is that, that that is just a part of it. It's not like she won this and then that happened. You have really used it in a very thoughtful way to to do exactly what you want to do and so as much as I love talking about that I'm really just excited to talk about what you see happening this next year what does it look like for you this next year is going to be very very heavily focused on being um selective of what I release next because I feel like whatever I release next is going to be um, this, whatever the song is, if it's just a song, I'm not sure yet, but whatever the song is, is going to go to, I'm going to push it to country radio. I'm going to promote the hell out of it. And the goal is for that song to be a hit for me. Um, I've gotten a taste of having a hit with Chris Young and wasting all these tears did great. It didn't reach number one, but you know, think of you did. And, um, it's a really amazing feeling to know that you know, you have people all over the country tuning in to a radio station and hearing your voice. Like I, you know, grew up listening to country radio. Right. So that's a, a huge goal. Um, and it's not going to be a decision made lightly. I'm going to really, you know, mull it over and probably end up recording a bunch of songs before making that final decision. Um, but it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be very thought out. Very thoughtful. Yeah, yeah. You posted something a few days ago. It was a beautiful post on social media that said, started 2020 off right with an awesome mental tune-up. Mm. There doesn't have to be this huge catastrophic thing to happen in your life for you to deserve clarity. I loved that so much. Can mm. you talk about the importance of wellness to you and how it impacts you as a music creator? Yes. Um, that post was... Uh, um, really scary for me to write because I, I know people associate, you know, mental health, um, with all the bad things that it can, it kind of is correlated with. But like for me, um, I did wait until something big and hard and awful happened in my life to go to therapy. And I wish I hadn't because then I was sort of faced with all these things that from my childhood and things that I hadn't really, um, worked through. Um, on top of going through what I was going through in that moment. So my reason for posting that was like, I really wanted people to know, like, you know, I think we all, I think we all think that none of our problems are big enough. Like, oh yeah, I'm going through this thing, but like that person mm-hmm. lost their mom. So that person. Who am I to feel like I, I to, need a little extra, right? Exactly. Who am I to think I need therapy? Like that's, and I think that that's like, honorable but I think that that's a really um I think if if people didn't think like that we'd have a lot more uh, you know healthy people in the world because um we don't realize the things that affected us so heavily when we were kids you know and our parents try their best but you know all all the good ones make mistakes doesn't matter so Mm. um 
that was my reason for that post and how it's affected my career is really honestly just going into sessions completely confident in who I am, the good, the bad. Um, and I, and I know what my stre strengths are and I can speak to those in a, a way that doesn't feel like I'm being cocky now. Absolutely. Um, I, a lot of times I'd struggle with like, I, I would know what I was good at and I would be afraid to voice those things because I didn't want to come off a certain way. But now it's like, you know what? I think if you just give me a sec to like think about what the melody could be here, then I'll, I'll really be able to like deliver. It's just like a lot of chaos going on right now. That's just an example of like what I can say now without feeling bad. Absolutely. Um, and then also just, you know, knowing myself makes the songs more, authentic and honest and a little bit more intentional because before I'd write songs that were uh, you know about um being super broken hearted and you know being like debilitated by it and then I'd go back and listen to it and be like oh but I I feel like I could have said that in more of a way that was like what it really looked like sure. yeah it's but I know at the end of the day I'm gonna be okay you know so like I found a way to write about myself and my feelings that were really to a T me and no compromising. So that, that was just like a, a product of, you know, getting my shit together and <laughs> going totally. to therapy and reading books. And I went to onsite, which, which is what I, uh, it's a workshop, um, which is what I posted about. And it was just a six day retreat, no phone is like a experiential therapy thing with like a small group. And it was amazing. It was hard, but it was amazing. Yeah. So that, that was just really an encouraging process, and I wanted to tell people about it. Right. Well, I think that especially with social media and how much people are on it and sharing everything too much, yeah. you know, all of that, yeah. the tide is turning a little bit when we're talking about wellness and mental health, and it's becoming more open yeah. and more of a conversation and less of a, a thing that is hidden away, yeah. which I think is is – is going to help so many people. I hope right? so. Just the I honesty mean, of it. Yeah. Um, ASCAP just launched a wellness initiative because we found out that so many of our members, they were saying, this is something that's really important to us. So mm. how can you be a supporter of that? And so we are launching all kinds of programs to support creative people because it is that's so amazing. important to have outlets that are creative but also constructive and helpful yeah for you mentally not just creatively right because they go they one feeds the other oh yeah it so does just yeah talking about it more I think is helpful and and um that's awesome I'm yeah glad you I, I love that, that you put that out there because it's it's a special thing to share and people want to know about you right and so yeah being real is a big part of the cool thing about social media when it's done right I know. Yeah. Cause every, I mean, every so often I catch myself like, I mean, I'm really, fo I, I'm too focused on social media. Like right now. I mean, I, when I was done with that retreat and I thought about opening Instagram, I had like this weird pit in my stomach. I was like, Oh, I think I have anxiety around social media. And I didn't realize didn't it until it, right. I stripped myself of it. And now I'm re re entering into that world. And I'm like, oh, I don't really want to go back. Sure. And I think because I was using it wrong. Like, I, you know, I, I know that I was posting what I was posting was fine. But like, you know, as far as lurking certain people and looking sure. at comments and taking them way too seriously and really diving into things that were unhealthy for me to see, like that, you know, it's morbid curiosity and it's so easy to, it, we're so exposed to it. But you know, you have to self-protect. You have to absolutely be careful. So I'm being really um, so thoughtful. So much information of, is so accessible. I'm, I'm talking I like, know. Think back, back in the day. I'm like, we didn't know what each other's living rooms look like unless we were like <laughs> in them. Now we're like, I know. oh, is that rug from West Elm? Girl, I love that. I have that. What? Yeah. How do we even know? I know. Too I much. Know. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I think it's like really amazing on certain fronts you know it's good to know when we can be helpful like everything sure. happening in Australia it's good to know we can where we can donate and um spreading the word about that is that kind of thing is great but there's some things that aren't on social media Absolutely. so I'm I think everybody needs to take a sec and be like okay where does this not serve me and how do I have a boundary for myself and social media Absolutely. Excellent advice from Miss Cassidy Pope. 
Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so you're, I am now a therapist. Yes. Well, I'm just kidding. There's a couch over there. I'm going yeah. to lay down. I yeah. need to talk to you about my feelings. <laughs> and that's okay. Right? It's so okay. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so you're here with us the same day that you're playing our ASCAP experience in the round at the legendary Bluebird Cafe. Um, all four songwriters in the round are veterans of our big annual conference in L.A. You were there last year. Mm. So... Um, what do you remember about that and why do you think it's valuable from the perspective of a budding professional songwriter, which is the attendance there? Yeah, yeah, it was fun. I mean, I, I loved looking out and being like, oh man, like everybody's here for the common goal and that's to be, you know, as creative as you can be and hopefully um, make a living out of it. You know, I know all of us, you know, we just want to make music and it makes us happy man but like we right. we need to pay our bills yes um so it's cool to uh to be on a stage like I, I did a writer's round at the expo and it was awesome to stand sit there and play songs and be like I am doing this for a living and you could too if you just stay the course um and I I got to play right after there was a panel where Megan Trainer and Jay Cash um, were, were on and they were answering questions. And I just remember thinking, man, like I, if I had this opportunity when I was, you know, just starting out writing and I got to come to a panel and ask Megan Trainer and Jay Cash questions, I mean, that would, what a gift that would be. Sure. Um, so I could tell like people were just eating it up and so they were just absorbing and soaking it all in. Um, and it was cool. Like, it was sort of um, ignited another new like flame in me, like looking out and seeing these hungry songwriters and artists like, damn, like they really want this. I need to make sure I stay on my game or I'm going to be, you know, passed on the street. So I uh, it, it was cool. It like reminded me of that spark and um, it was cool to see. It was amazing. I mean, the, the expo is I mean, there's just so many things to see and so many people to talk to. So I, I think it's a, a really cool thing everybody should try if you're, you know, an aspiring musician, songwriter. Yeah. So you heard Cassidy tell you, check out the ASCAP experience happening this spring in Los Angeles. Any final words of wisdom or advice? Um, <laughs> oh, uh, Put you on the spot, girl. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think people think that all the biggest songwriters and biggest artists, all they write are hits. And I just want to be here to tell everybody that is not the case. Like, I mean, and this is no shade on any of the big songwriters in town anywhere because they would say the same thing. Like, I've had sessions where I'm shit, you know? Like, I am like, what is happening today? Why am I so bad? And then another day, literally the next day, I could be like, man, I'm awesome. I'm the best lyricist. I'm the best <laughs> melody writer. Like, yes. Um, so I just want people to know, like, you ha you'll have good days and bad days. Don't put so much pressure on yourself to have every session be the day you write your big hit. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us and Thanks, for all of ben. your support for the for the thoughtful programming that we do for songwriters here. You've always been such a big supporter and for being your sweet, honest self all the time um, I can say it personally and professionally that you are just one of the the sweetest human beings that I've ever known but also the the privilege of working with in this really wacky industry Thank you know you. so right back at everyone you. could be like Cassidy Pope oh and that'd be it that'd be a good good wish for 2020 and beyond no oh, you're sweet Thank yeah you. I love you stop I love you too thanks for hanging thank you thanks for having me